Welcome back to the Gnome Show, everyone. I am Josh, your humble host, and it is my duty, nay, my pleasure, to trawl the briny depths of YouTube so that I may bring you the shinies. I cover short films of varying genres, video games, analog horror and sci-fi, and anything, really, uh, that I think is groovy. I hope you'll enjoy tonight's offerings, content for the blood god. <clears throat> Coming on with the show. Tonight we have uh, the dark Tonight we have the dark philosophy of cosmicism. There we go. I said it all at once. Right. Yes. Uh, by eternalized um, and generally, um, I guess, uh, surrounding H.P. Lovecraft. As you can. Mm, nope. See on the title here. Whatever. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. So. Settle in, make sure you have your coffee, your snacks, your thinking cap, and maybe your philosophizing uh, uh, tinfoil hat on. Um, let's boogie. Probably going to want to do a dab during this. The oldest and strongest emotion of mankind is fear. And the oldest and strongest kind of fear is fear of the unknown. Fear of the unknown is something that has been with mankind from the very beginning. Man's first instincts and emotions formed his response to the environment in which he found himself. The unknown, being likewise the unpredictable, became for our primitive forefathers an omnipotent source of boons and calamities visited upon mankind. And it never stopped. When we came ashore from uh, from England into this new area and uh, everything beyond the shore <coughs> was <coughs> was dark and mysterious and dangerous and full of evil, and uh, we treated everything as such. It's 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 an instinct, like you know, uh, like being in a dark forest. Uh, there are a lot of things in it. Some of them better have better instincts and capabilities than you. Um, but you're still all in the dark forest together. Um, and it's frightening. So it's not an unrational or it's not an irrational uh, fear. Uh, and it has kept us alive. <laughs> it really has. The ancient Greeks believed in gods and goddesses who they thought had control over the world and of people's lives. And what else are you going to think when you see a fucking um, a hurricane um, off the coast or lightning bolts hurled from the clouds or sea creatures that you've never seen before, giant whales, uh, that, you know, and, and beasts and things that, you know, like we're just people in cloth you know like we've gotten nothing we have no defenses except for what we can make and you know imagine so yeah of course we would think there were gods i mean still do i mean i you know i'm i'm a catholic so i you know i still believe in god it's it's like it just it hasn't changed you know what i'm saying like uh, we're all still looking for answers they prayed to these gods for help and protection because if the gods were unhappy, they would punish them. As time went on, they started to seek explanations based on natural principles rather than gods as primary causes, and became the first natural philosophers, or what we now call scientists. Science has since then helped us explain many of these previously unknown phenomena, but it has also shown us how much still remains unknown in the vastness of the universe. Howard Phillips Lovecraft was an American writer of weird fiction, born in 1890, who introduced the unknown as the object of fear. The novelty of his approach lies in the exploration of new scientific areas, in which the possibility of new unknown beings... We still have that fear now. Being uh, uh, a spacefaring, uh, or, or a, a species that wants to be spacefaring, a spacefaring... Um, you know, we um, 
we face a re- very real danger in the dark forest uh, uh, theory. <clears throat> so let's say the reason that we don't see any aliens or we don't make any direct contact, um, we don't have any evidence uh, beyond what is is presented to us, and even then, it's only eh. the very fact that there could be and they're hiding because uh, uh, revealing yourself um, either uh, it, it presents a problem to everybody else because either you're a threat or you're something they can conquer. It's a very basic principle that we have here on Earth. Um, so um, we have a fear now still of the unknown you know like every time we look up we stare out in wonder but also in terror because there's only like a thin fucking shell of an atmosphere separating us from the void right mr no soup no soup for you um so yeah let's continue hiding among the stars arose the vast infinite cosmic depth produces an overwhelming emotion that paralyzes us. Alienation, insignificance, fear, anxiety, and madness are all recurring themes in Lovecraft's work, and which he experienced firsthand throughout his life. It is important then to know of his biography. Lovecraft was an insecure and anxious boy who suffered from frequent illnesses, many of them apparently psychological. When he was three years old, his father Winfield Scott Lovecraft was committed to a mental asylum after a psychotic <coughs> episode and later died of syphilis. His mother, Sarah Susan Phillips Lovecraft, became overprotective of him, never letting him out of her sight. Lovecraft's maternal grandfather, Whipple Van Buren Phillips, became a father figure to him, introducing him to classical literature, poetry, and weird tales, and ironically, even helping him overcome his fear of the dark. He became the center of his entire universe. Lovecraft was a precocious youth. He was reciting poetry at age two, reading at age three, and writing at age six or seven. He became an avid reader, and he would spend most of his time in his private library. The death of his grandmother, Robbie, had a profound effect on him. It sent his family into a gloom from which it never fully recovered. His mother and aunts wore black dresses to mourn her death and Lovecraft started having nightmares of beings referred to as night gaunts. They would snatch him up and carry him through infinite leagues of black air over the towers of dead and horrible cities, until they would reach a grey void full of needle-like pinnacles of enormous mountains, where they would let him drop. He would wake up screaming. These creatures That's later appeared in Lovecraft's sometimes. fiction. After the death of his grandfather, Lovecraft and his mother would be forced to leave their lavish Victorian home which they lived in and move to a more modest house. Lovecraft hey, called his... Yeah, I mean, you've got to make sense out of it somehow, don't you? You know? One of the darkest times of his life, where he saw no point in living anymore and considered committing suicide. However, his desire for knowledge and contemplation on how much there was still left to explore prevented him from doing so. At the age of eight, he discovered science. For I think that is what drives most of us. Like, uh, like, yeah, we'd like to fucking sit down, give up, just fade into non-existence and not have to care about anything. But no. We have a very real drive to not only survive, but to thrive in our environment. It's one of those things that's built in. Um, and <clears throat> we, uh, you know, like, to not give in, I, you know, it's, it's, it's just, it's how we got here. I, like, um, um, taking yourself out of this world... Um, I mean, 
in 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 my eyes it's giving up like it, it is like cheating like you know like you're ending the game beforehand like before you know what i'm saying like you know no you can't t- you can't call timeout like to, you know like and who knows if there is um such a um <coughs> <coughs> penalty for taking yourself out um, in, a, in, a, in a world where we have sometimes witnessed karma firsthand it's not such a foreign concept I think first chemistry then astronomy the latter would have uh, the mechanism uh, a, pen- um, okay. a penalty mechanism for taking yourself out I mean that's not such a, a foreign concept I think a sense of the vast universe and the insignificance of humanity within the cosmos. At school, Lovecraft excelled at all subjects except for mathematics, and in 1908 he experienced a nervous collapse while studying at high school. He dropped out and remained self-taught for the rest of his life. Lovecraft would develop a love-hate relationship with his mother. She would call him hideous and say that he hid from everyone and did not like to go out where people could gaze on him. He actually grew up to believe this, and there are reports that he would mother. walk along the streets, hiding his face in a raincoat so that nobody could see him. Lovecraft was invited to a group of amateur journalists and obtained a renewal to live. For the first time, he met with like-minded individuals and felt at home. It's always nice when you find out what you were supposed to do. You know, like, you find, like, a group of people that gets you, you know, you know, knows who you are, uh, accepts who you, who accepts you for who you are. That's, that's always a, a really nice thing. It can, it can, it can help a person maintain. He became involved in detailed correspondence with many people and eventually became one of the most prolific letter writers of the century. Lovecraft wrote an estimated of a hundred thousand letters during his lifetime, many of which are as interesting as his stories and give us a deep understanding of his lifestyle and beliefs. In 1921, Lovecraft's mother experienced a nervous breakdown and was admitted to the same place Lovecraft's father had died 21 years ago. She died after complications from an operation on her gallbladder. Lovecraft again experienced a deep state of sadness and contemplated suicide. He eventually recovered and shortly met Sonia Green, who became his wife, and the move to New York. However, I would imagine like him being able to like uh, uh, thrive away from his mother probably helped him, but I get the the sense that he was damaged like for good. Like I, I mean, like no, you can always try to 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 fix things but you know like some things some things go real deep they both had financial issues and eventually had to part ways as his wife's employment required constant travel lovecraft could also not stand living in new york he felt alienated in an enormous city full of foreigners his own detachment thus contributed to the general atmosphere of his writings at his time Racism and xenophobia was not uncommon, and Lovecraft fell victim to it as well. But we must understand that he was a product of his time. Nevertheless, it remains a highly controversial... You know, it's, uh, like, we we often brush over this, but a, there were a lot of us that were like that back in that age. Um, the xenophobia, um, that was a general sentiment of the U.S. Uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, before World War Two, I think um, maybe World War One, but definitely World War Two, we were very xenophobic, um, uh, and the racism. Yeah, of course that speaks for itself. Um, he he did uh, well. He did recant some of the nastier things he had in his uh, in his character, but I mean. Not feeling at home at New York just because there are so many foreign people. Mm. 
controversial aspect of his popular reception. In 1926, Locke... I would be into the food. I would be eating all kinds of fucking foreign foods, man. Mm. Lovecraft returned to his beloved homeland in Providence, Rhode Island, where he would live until his death. He famously wrote, I am Providence. He continued living at the verge of poverty, and most of his great works appeared in cheap pulp magazines, many of them remaining practically unknown. Lovecraft's health was deteriorating, and after experiencing excruciating pain, making him physically incapable of holding a pen, he paid a visit to the doctor. The cancer had spread to his intestine. He remained in constant pain until his death in 1937. It is likely that he died, convinced that his work would dissipate into nothingness. Lovecraft's traumatic life could easily have ended differently, but he did not let the dark times discourage him. They instead inspired him to continue writing. Luckily, many of his friends saw the value in his work and were determined to preserve his work. Today, he is considered as one of the greatest weird fiction writers the world has ever seen. Lovecraft's stories don't really focus on character development as much as the phenomena surrounding them and their emotions experiencing the unknown. The bleakness of his stories is quite refreshing, and few writers have written so poignantly. His writings can really shake you up. Lovecraft shifted the source of horror from the traditional belief in vampires, ghosts and demons to the immense and unplumbed abysses beyond space and time. As mentioned, from an early age, he attained the idea that humanity is cosmically insignificant from his studies of astronomy. The universe compared to the infinitely small Earth and humanity's... I wonder how vastly different um, some of these people's views would be if they had a glimpse into the real future, like, a, uh, like, a, like seeing into space and seeing all the wonders that we've seen, seeing the planets and everything in all their glory, um, if their opinions would be different, or if they would be as <clears throat> spicy as they were back then. Existence is so vast that from a cosmic perspective, human history, knowledge, religion, etc. is completely irrelevant and meaningless. Lovecraft emphasizes the fear of the unknown and unknowable. The fear we feel when confronted by phenomena beyond our comprehension, whose scope extends beyond the narrow field of human affairs. His philosophy is known as Cosmicism, which focuses on the insignificance of humanity and its doings at the cosmos at large. In contrast to the anthropocentric philosophies in which many find intellectual reassurance, this form of non-anthropocentrism is crucial to the philosophy of Cosmicism. The question of the meaning of life was better left unanswered. Cosmicism is a type of extreme existentialism, as it brings up the uncertainty about the role of humanity in the uncaring universe, an existential crisis on a large scale. Lovecraft embraces <coughs> the truth of reality. Things are important to us on the human scale, but we simply don't matter in the cosmos. He described us as the miserable denizens of a wretched little flashback on the back door of a microscopic universe. Lovecraft portrays wow. us human beings as ants in the vast realms of space and time, an incomprehensibly large universe that creates a fear of the cosmic void. <clears throat> this constitutes a serious blow to mankind's self-confidence. After millennia of living in the darkness, turning on the light will make us realize that there are others living with us. He thought that there was a point in which we could not cope with scientific discoveries. Are the wrong most about merciful that? thing in the world, I think, is the inability of the human mind to correlate all its contents. We live on a placid island of ignorance, in the midst of black seas of infinity, and it was not meant that we should voyage far. The sciences, each straining in its own direction, have hitherto harmed us little, but some day the piercing together of dissociated knowledge will open up such terrifying vistas of reality and of our frightful position therein that we shall either go mad from the revelation or flee from the deadly light into the peace and safety of a new dark age. So, um, he was wrong about us like being able to deal with technology. Oh, no. 
not entirely. It is true that every time we, um, yeah, from beyond, yeah, that was a good one. Um, uh, hold on, one, one. So there was a time when we brought all our disparate sciences together and we created an unholy weapon that we're still fucking trying to get over now. Um, <clears throat> and then, <clears throat> then we started focusing on computers and, and, and I'm not saying that AI is the next, uh, nuclear, uh, problem, but, um, it could be, um, but the thing is, we're going to like humanity and technology are going to move forward regardless. Like, you know, technology is just exponential. It will keep leaping. Uh, so AI is here. It's going to be here. It's going to get stronger. It's going to get like better. It's going to get more diverse. It's going to get more complex. Um, and one day we'll probably have a little hologram on our shoulder or on our watch um, or like uh, is our holographic dog or a holographic parrot or something. Uh, that can uh, help us with our daily lives and, you know, help, help us navigate the cosmos uh, or the oceans or the inner earth uh, or whatever, um, cyberspace, um, who knows, uh, but it's going to keep going. Uh, and um, the piecing together of disassociated knowledge will open, su open up such terrifying vistas of reality and of our frightful position therein. Yes, definitely. Every decade, like uh, every you know, like we we face ourselves, and we you know, like uh, we we forge new territory. Uh, flee? I don't think so. Humanity has never fled from anything. Um, but uh, like destroying ourselves into a new dark age, it's happened a couple of times. Scientific discovery in Lovecraft's work is both fascinating and terrible, and he sees in it not the potential for the enlightenment of humanity, but as the ultimate exterminator of our human species. Knowledge is a self-annihilating disease. The contemplation of mankind's place in the vast, comfortless and cold universe revealed by modern science gives way to the discovery of unfathomable things which our mortal brains cannot comprehend. In The Color Out of Space, one of Lovecraft's personal favorites, a meteorite with an indescribable color crashes on a farm. It was only by analogy that they called it a color at all. As things from beyond the cosmos enter our world, they retain their external qualities to such a degree that humans cannot perceive and understand them. This cosmic malady made of a never-before-seen color from outer space upsets human perception and eludes all scientific explanation. An unknown force poisons every living thing, while people go insane or die one by one. Lovecraft's cosmic horror was achieved through devices that would, he hoped, feel completely foreign and unknown to the reader. This mood was meant to be crafted in unfamiliar and uncomfortable territory, a hard goal to achieve. However, cosmicism does not only mean the fear of the cosmic depths, in Lovecraft's stories, the unknown forces also lurk in the depths of the Earth, oceans, distant territories, and in the equally vast recesses of the dreamlands. Lovecraft explored this preternatural territory through what is known as the Cthulhu Mythos, although he did not coin this term himself. This word is supposed to be a completely non-human word, and there's no correct way to pronounce it. However, Lovecraft wrote that the closest pronunciation is Clulu. Unlike <coughs> Clulu. most horrific creatures, these entities do not seek our destruction, but rather appear as utterly indifferent to humanity, and it is merely by accident that they have a relationship with us. The coincidental alignment makes these gods no better than the remaining cosmic forces, and by ignoring humans, they are actually contributing to the sense of alienation. They stand for symbols of cosmic outsideness, which we can only grasp a tiny fraction. 
The horror derives from the realization wow. that common human laws, interests, and emotions have no validity or significance in the vast cosmos at large. Consequently, the entities in Lovecraft's world were not evil, they were far beyond human conceptions of morality. They exist in a dark reality for which nothing is impossible and is beyond human access. They represent the essence of externality, as he writes. To achieve the essence of real externality, whether of time or space or dimension, one must forget that such things as organic life, good and evil, love and hate, and all such local attributes of a negligible and temporary race called mankind have any exist- Quantum compute. um, depends, man. Like, um... Uh, again, those com com uh, combinations of disparate sciences coming together could do wonderful or terrifying things. Um, imagine uh, an AI with uh, 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 powered by quantum computers. I mean, uh, um, I, it's, there, there's a lot of things that scare me. Robotics scares me, uh, but... Um, I think AI is probably the one we've got to be most uh, careful about. Quantum computing, I, I think that's going to be the thing that like uh, allows us space travel. I do. Uh, and it'll probably be a combination of AI and quantum computing that allows us to do that. Um, because you would have to have something to be able to watch over us while we were asleep, traveling vast distances. Um, you know, or somebody... Um, already set up uh, to be able to welcome uh, humans uh, to their new location. Uh, somebody to run the ship, uh, uh, do things that humans aren't, uh, aren't capable of doing, uh, like handling highly toxic or volatile anything, uh, working around a, a, a star drive or whatever we're using. You know, just... <clears throat> Anything can go terribly wrong, uh, I think. Uh, it just depends on how we turn out to use it, you know? Uh, um, uh, in most respects, thank God, uh, we don't have supervillains. Most respects, we don't. I mean, every once in a generation, it happens. Um, but, um, I don't know. I, um... Yeah, right, you know, like, uh, but it feels like it's going to be like that kind of thing uh, where uh, um, we can uh, actually grasp teleportation, um, uh, Dyson spheres, um, uh, orbital shipyards, um, extra uh, extra planetary travel, um, you know, like without having to start from Earth atmosphere first. That would be pretty cool. I um having a a, a a launch point on the moon or um, um a a real um a staging ground colony I guess on Mars that would be pretty cool <coughs> and we would need the uh, computing to help us do it because uh, I don't I mean like some of those big ass fucking supercomputers <coughs> here and in China and Japan and in, uh, you know in a couple other places. You know, like, you know, like, but you can't move them. Like, you know, you can't, like, take one with you on a starship just yet. I mean, you probably could, but I don't know. <clears throat> ...at all. The Clulu mythos comprises a purposely incomplete body of law rather than a complete system of knowledge. However, Lovecraft talks about several types of entities. Elder things, great old ones, deep ones, and <coughs> out of guards. The true horror is the mere knowledge that these entities exist and have come from the stars long before human civilization. The Elder Things were the first alien species to colonize Earth a billion years ago. They created Shoggoths, protoplasmic shape-shifting beings, able to reflect all forms and organs, who served as slaves to build vast cities, but rebelled against their masters. 
the great city ruins remain Will frozen not work in for peanuts. and some of these entities can be found as fossils or in frozen hibernation. In At the Mountains of Madness, a group of explorers lead an expedition to Antarctica and are met with the Shoggoths. It was a terrible, indescribable thing, faster than any subway train, a shapeless congeries of protoplasmic bubbles, faintly self-luminous, and with myriads of temporary eyes forming and unforming as pustules of greenish light all over the tunnel-filling front that bore down upon us, crushing the frantic penguins and slithering over the glistening floor that it and its kind had swept so evilly, free of all litter. The great old ones, on the other hand, are a group of unique, immortal beings that were rulers and gods over Earth, but now reside stagnant yet eternal in various locations around the Earth. These are... To be fair, most of these uh, elder gods uh, and whatnot are trapped here for reasons. Um, <laughs> there are a lot that, uh, should they be freed, would uh, would be the end of us. We would, we would, we would be nothing. Absolutely nothing. Kin to demigods. Clulu is one such entity, the high priest and the great dreamer, who He's lies in a deep Pacific slumber ocean. beneath the ocean. It is a monster of vaguely anthropoid outline, but with an octopus-like head. Octopi are, indeed, some of the most alien creatures to humans on Earth. The thing cannot be described. There is no language for such abysms of shrieking and immemorial lunacy, such eldritch contradictions of all matter, force and cosmic order. A mountain walked or stumbled. Clulu echoes the word Chthonic, one who inhabits the underworld. He resides in the underwater city of Relia, deep within the unknown, within the unconscious. He is sleeping, yet eternal, waking, yet dreaming, dead, yet alive. That is not dead which can eternal lie, and with strange eons even death may die. This mysterious line expresses Clulu's immense existence beyond human thought. In its eternal form, even the concept of death is no more. He had cast a spell on the Great Old Ones, and while they no longer live, they have never really died. While asleep, they communicate with humans through the dreamlands of the collective unconscious. Clulu is a source of constant... I... I don't know if that's necessarily true. Um... Like, uh, there are, I think a number of them aren't capable of, um, uh, uh, of penetrating the dreamlands. Um, like, from my understanding, a lot of the, like, a lot of the influence comes through mad people or, um, interacting with things you shouldn't, um, uh, learning knowledge you shouldn't, um, things like that, um, the dreamlands that's a holy like that's a more complex subject uh the dreamlands are our humanity's collective unconscious dreams uh not just us but everything uh in the universe i think um and uh there are certainly probably um parts of the dreamlands that are made up by the gods by the elder gods or the outer gods or the i think the elder gods um, or maybe it is the outer gods. I don't know. The ones like, um, Azathoth and, um, um, the, oh, fuck. Uh, there's a bunch of the ones that are outside human comprehension completely. Like those, those conceptual beings that defy any rational description. Uh, those guys. So I'm sure that some of those contribute to the dreamlands um azathoth azathoth i think is the blind idiot god that dreams like if you were to ever wake up we would poof out of existence and anxiety for mankind at an unconscious level so the dreamlands Around might the be Earth, his dreamlands the called praise the great old ones chanting in his house at relia that clulu waits dreaming when the stars are aligned the underwater city will rise, and, with the help of the eternal Clulu cult, the great old ones will awaken and regain what was once theirs. The cult prays to their own demise, unbeknownst to them, as the entities are beyond good and evil, 
Any hint of malevolence is strictly the interpretation of the human who seeks an explanation for the unexplainable. In The Call of Clulu, the protagonist who was previously consumed with curiosity and traveled to unravel his mysterious findings, is terrified upon discovering the truth of the existence of the Great Old Ones. I shall never sleep calmly again when I think of the horrors that lurk ceaselessly behind life in time and in space. Lovecraft introduces the Deep Ones in the shadow over Innsmouth, an ocean dwelling and the deep ones are the most recognizable for any uh, for people uh, in mainstream um, uh, fish people. Basically, um, they worship Dagon. Um, Dagon, uh, by the way, uh, Mister No Soup for you. Dagon is another uh, 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 or Lovecrafty ish. Relo of crafty in film that you would enjoy. It's very, very gory and nasty. Um, it's really good. Uh, but that's about deep ones and the fish people and, and all of that. Uh, the people that, um, as they grow older, they start turning more fish-like and their eyes bulge and they get gills and they disappear from human, uh, like from sight, from like from regular life. And before they just go off into the water and live... Uh, uh, Underneath, uh, with, uh, Cthulhu, or Dagon, uh, I don't know, some of them worship one, some of them worship the other. Amphibious humanoid race that have strong ties with Cthulhu and an affinity yeah. for mating with humans. Right they worship Dagon, the most powerful of the Deep Ones. However, the most powerful of all entities... It's not quite clear whether Dagon is uh, a Deep One or if he is just uh, the Leviathan that the Deep Ones worship. Oh, the outer. And there's also a mother um, uh, uh, as well. Gods. Cosmic entities located beyond the confines of Earth. The most notable ones include Yogg-Sothoth, shub Niggurath, Near Lethotep, and Asathoth. Yeah, these guys. Most of them dwell in the outer void yeah, the outer outside gods. of thought and existence, beyond the ultimate gate, which leads fearsomely and perilously to the last void, which is outside all Earths, all universes, and all matter. The ultimate gate can only be unlocked with the silver key, an ancient artifact that unlocks the gate of space and time and allows access to remote places of the universe. It also allows one access to all possible lives one may live or have lived. This gate is guarded by Yogg-Sothoth, for whom time and space shares no boundaries. Yogg-Sothoth knows the gate. Yogg-Sothoth is the gate. Yogg-Sothoth is the key and guardian of the gate. Past, present, future, all are one in Yogg-Sothoth. Yogg-Sothoth holds the knowledge of everything and is the gatekeeper of it. Those who worship him seek the key to forbidden knowledge. However, it always leads to madness, as it opens a door to places we were never meant to travel. Lovecraft describes Shub Niggurath as Yoxothoth's wife and a hellish cloud-like entity. Beyond this, there isn't much else to her. She can only be referred to as something unknowable, the not-to-be-named one. While most of the outer gods are exiled to the stars, Near Lathotep, however. This guy. Uh, of all of the outer gods, uh, this guy likes to mess with humans the most. Uh, he is the uh, one of the few that will directly interact with humanity, like, you know, like get in our business and do things. Um, he's also the messenger of the gods. Um, and uh, he's, he's a nasty piece of work is active and frequently walks the earth in the guise of a human being. He is a go-between for humans and the gods, linking us to the entities beyond comprehension. As the crawling chaos and cosmic shapeshifter, he has infinite shapes and innumerable forms. He is deliberately deceptive and manipulative, representing the archetype of the trickster. He reminds us of the existence of that which we cannot truly know. Asathoth is the all-powerful creator of existence. He is known as the blind idiot god, 
who is absolutely mindless and unconscious, but is omnipotent and is the most powerful being of the entire mythos. All of reality is merely a part of his dream, unknowingly created by itself. He is a dreaming monster in whose dream the universe resides. Countless lesser deities play maddening tunes on innumerable drums and flutes to keep Azathoth from awakening, for if he should awaken, all of existence would be no more, and all would once again be Azathoth. He is the embodiment of disorder and cannot be destroyed, as the concept of destruction is merely his dream, and he exists beyond all human concepts. Lovecraft's fictional gods are relegated to the background of his stories. They are never the focal point and rarely the cause of the unfolding of events, but they are always present, which is an important element of cosmic horror. To express the unknown, Lovecraft used mathematical concepts and bizarre landscapes that should not be able to exist. Oh, that's a nice picture. The geometry of the dream place he saw was abnormal, non-Euclidean, and loathsomely redolent of spheres and dimensions apart from ours. Lovecraft's use of abnormal geometries to capitalize on the fear of the unknown is found in many of his stories. He was swallowed up by an angle of masonry which shouldn't have been there, an angle which was acute but behaved as if it were obtuse. One gets the impression that Lovecraft had a great intuitive grasp of what glimpses of the fourth dimension would seem like to us how the geometry would appear non-Euclidean and all wrong. His descriptions of abominations like Clulu fit well with what one would imagine a fourth dimensional creature might be like in our space, how they seem to have shape that was not made of matter. It is as if an ant who lives in a two-dimensional world sees a human being. It simply cannot process it. Our hand would look like strange bony and fleshy meat with warm pulsing liquid suddenly appearing and disappearing out of sight. Similarly, Lovecraft's cosmic entities and objects exist in dimensions beyond our own. All the objects, organic and inorganic alike, were totally beyond description or even comprehension. Gilman sometimes compared the inorganic masses to prisms, labyrinths, clusters of cubes and planes, and cyclopean buildings and the organic things struck him variously as groups of bubbles, octopi, centipedes, living Hindu idols, and intricate arabesques roused in a kind of ophidian animation. Everything he saw was unspeakably menacing and horrible, and whenever one of the organic entities appeared by its motions to be noticing him, he felt a stark, hideous fright, which generally jolted him awake. Of how the organic entities moved, he could tell no more than of how he moved himself. In time he observed a further <coughs> mystery, the tendency of certain entities to appear suddenly out of empty space, or to disappear totally with equal suddenness. Oh, that's Lovecraft's world evades any visualization. We can only hint at their description with our limited knowledge, adding to the- The, imagin the imagination is always uh, more vivid than anything we can put to paper, even when we do put it to paper. The uncanniness of the unknown. If we were to be tormented by these creatures, we would be powerless to resist. We cannot perceive them unless they choose to enter our three-dimensional world. They watch our every move. While we see nothing of them, we are entirely at their mercy. At any moment, one of these cosmic entities could seep through into our dimension, instantly kill us, and disappear without trace. When we see what is supposed to remain unseen, and it becomes the new reality, it induces true cosmic horror, disorientation, and anxiety. Having the very fabric of space and time, physics, and the laws of nature change into completely unknown ones is something that leaves one without words. Only our emotions are at their mercy. If we do not know something, we create our own answer who created the universe, what happens after death, etc. Because we cannot yeah. bear the silence of the void. Many of Lovecraft's characters seek forbidden knowledge, only to descend into madness from the revelation of it. The most forbidden book being the dreaded Necronomicon, written by the mad Arab Abdul al-Hasred. The pursuit of knowledge often leads to the character's death, 
However, many continue to pursue forbidden knowledge, knowing that it may well end up terribly. Coming to know a certain reality can result in a full or partial destruction of the self. For instance, when given a certain diagnosis of a disease, what was not known is made known, and is at least partially horrific, because the patient did not always know it to be the case. Yet once the presence of the disease is known, it becomes part of the self. There is no resisting such revelations. There's no That's going creepy. back. Lovecraft also had a lifelong interest in dreams, and many of his stories are the product of his dreams. The unconscious symbolizes the archetype of the unknown. The dreamlands, in Lovecraft's world, are windows into forbidden knowledge and forces beyond humanity's understanding. A vast, uncanny, and incomprehensible dimension that can be entered through dreams. The Dream Cycle is a series of short stories and novellas by Lovecraft, one of the most notable of which is The Dream Quest of Unknown Kadath, illustrating the scope and wonder of humankind's ability to dream. Everyone has their own dreamland, but share a common general land of vision. Lovecraft's stories are so bizarre that the average reader is stripped of all their preconceptions about reality, and even their sense of self. In the stories, the characters who fear the loss of individuality and attempt to preserve it are the ones who fall into madness. The concept of otherness, of the quality of being different, is important to be integrated. The self and the other are to be simultaneously accepted. In the story, Through the Gate of the Silver Key, the protagonist, Randolph Carter, holds the mysterious silver key and opens the ultimate gate. There he sees his past and future selves, yet he also begins to see Carters in every known and suspected age of Earth's history. These Carters are all equally himself. That's he even knows creepy. how each small decision alters who each of those Carters become in their own timelines. This omniscient awareness gives way to a loss of individuality. One learns that one is no longer a definite being, distinguished from other beings. Therefore, the other becomes just as worthy of acceptance and consideration as oneself. French philosopher Gilles Deleuze describes this as a transformation from paranoia to schizomadness, concepts which are used as philosophical metaphors describing perceptions of one's identity. Those with paranoia have an urge to align everything with their identity and disregard otherness. On the other hand, schizomadness refers to an integration of the unconscious, accepting other identities, beings, and one simultaneous place among them. This is also reminiscent of Carl wow. Jung's approach of individuation, where one integrates one's unconscious contents in order to advance towards the self. One must accept the loss of individuality by acknowledging that one is not the master of one's own house, but this is usually met with paranoid resistance. Through the reading of Lovecraft, the reader goes through their own anti-human becoming. A window into otherness unveils the monster as none other than oneself, and the horror to change. Sir, you wanted philosophy. Here it is. This is the only monster we are meant to conquer. In The Outsider, Lovecraft tells the tale of a man who lives in solitude in a decaying dark castle and can't recall when or if he ever saw a living person. He decides to climb the tower into the unknown outer sky since it was better to glimpse the sky and perish than to live without ever seeing the light of day. He enters a window and is met with people whose faces were hideously distorted with fear fleeing with horrible screams. The man trembles at the thought of what might be lurking near him, unseen. He then sees a reflection. I know always that I am an outsider, a stranger in this century and among those who are still men. This I have known ever since I stretched out my fingers to the abomination within that great gilded frame, stretched out my fingers and touched a cold and unyielding surface of polished glass. So looking at oneself and seeing something that you really, really don't like. I hope you enjoyed this video. We you did. can support the channel on Patreon. Or 
Um, so um, that was the dark philosophy of cosmicism. Um, I'm not necessarily all doom and gloom, but I have had my fair share of staring up at the ceiling uh, or the sky and feeling absolutely lost uh, and terribly insignificant. Um, so I get it and I identify heavily uh with it and like it's to me some of the best movies are made with this principle in mind when it comes to horror it's not the jump scares uh it's the tension uh it's not uh, necessarily the monsters it's what the monsters represent uh monsters don't need to be anything but humans uh being absolutely vile you know um or, or even humans having the best of intentions, but still being absolutely vile. Um, it's a part of the human condition. Uh, you know, you can't separate that. Um, but, yeah. Um, we just got to deal with it as best we can. Can't... Uh, can't exit the game before the end, um, but um, we're built to uh, we're built to survive, to persevere. Uh, so I think we're okay. Uh, shying away from technology, um, I don't think um, that's ever going to happen. We have a, a super super heavy appetite for technology, uh, and we are very poised to go to space. Um, although I wish we would um, we would concentrate on fixing our oceans and our environment first before we go out and bang around in the universe. <sighs> but when have we ever done that? So um, that was uh, the dark philosophy of cosmicism by uh, by eternalized. Um, that was a nice deep think piece. Uh, thank you to No Soup for you for um recommending a philosophy piece i do them um every so often uh when, when i want to get uh metaphysical with things so uh yeah uh expect more of this um uh, like subscribe and share i love you all be safe happy and healthy and i'll see you in the next one